I'm Susan Swain, host of C-SPAN's Q&A, where we spend an hour with nonfiction writers and historians who add context to today's news. This week, you'll hear from Matthew Green, political scientist and author based at Catholic University in Washington, D.C. As the nation watches Speaker Nancy Pelosi lead the House, we asked Matt Green, an expert on congressional leadership, to give us a primer on significant past House speakers. Matthew Green, John Nance Garner, who was Speaker of the House from 1931 to 1933 and then became FDR's vice president, once said, the Speaker of the House job is the hardest job in Washington. Do you agree? Absolutely, I agree. And what's interesting about that statement is it was made at a time when speakers had a lot fewer responsibilities and duties than they they do today. So if anything, it's even more so that it's the most difficult job in Washington. Unlike the Senate majority, this position, the speakers, is named in the Constitution without a lot of detail beyond that. Uh, But I'm wondering, when the framers created the position, they were looking to the English model. What did they have in mind? Well, they were thinking about... um, the a kind of model of the speakership where it was a position that had some parliamentary responsibilities so it was his job was to preside over the chamber and make sure the rules were being followed fairly um, but they uh, also understood that um, the position could uh, take on other responsibilities and I think it's telling that it's a it's mentioned only once in the Constitution and says only the House shall choose its speaker and leaves the rest up to uh, the House itself to determine what the Speaker's responsibilities will be. Over time, has it evolved as the institution has changed, or have the people that have been in it changed the job, or combination? Well, I think it's a combination. Um, Certainly, the larger context in which Speakers have to operate, the House itself, um, our national governments, the larger political context, has changed. And with that, there's been new responsibilities and duties that have been imposed on speakers. Um, But at the same time, there have been individuals who have made a profound uh, impact on the speakership and changed the way it governs and operates. Our viewers see Nancy Pelosi on the news every day. They see her, obviously, in her role all the time on C-SPAN. What we thought we would do is learn from you about some of the powerful people in the past who have shaped the role and also shaped the country through legislation. Uh, But along the way, let's start with the modern speaker. And if you could give us kind of an overview of how the speaker's office is organized today. Uh, What are the tools? Uh, How large is the staff? Give us some sense of what Nancy Pelosi really oversees in the Congress. Sure. So um, to think about it in the broader context, the Speaker of the House has a number of responsibilities, the modern Speaker of the House. Um, Part of it is just presiding over the House chamber, although they rarely do that. They have someone who's doing that for them. But they are technically responsible for presiding over the House and making sure the rules are being followed. They're also the leader of their party. And so with that comes expectations that they'll help their party pass its legislative agenda. They might help set that agenda. They'll also um, expect it to help with campaigns, um, you know, raising money, these kinds of things to help their fellow partisans get elected. They also have a, a public role to play. Um, so they're expected to, to do interviews, to be in the public sphere, uh, and to represent their party as well as the House as a whole. And those are just some of the many responsibilities they have, which is why it's such a difficult job. Do you have a sense of how large their staff is today or how large the administrative budget of the Speaker's office is? Uh, I don't know offhand what the, the exact number is, but it has grown significantly over the last uh, several decades. And so it's become one of the, um, you know, one of, one of the, one of, it's become a position with a lot of staff and a large budget. What uh, are the tools <clears throat> that they have in order to keep their, con- their caucus or the entire Congress in line? So uh, speakers have both formal and informal tools at their disposal. Um, they do have uh, the power of recognition, so they can decide who gets to, be, gets to speak on the House floor. Um, they also have within their party uh, a number of powers, and the Republicans and Democrats differ here, but they usually have the power to influence committee assignments. So they can decide who is on what committee to some degree and also who chairs committees. And so by that way, they can reward those who are loyal and also punish those who are disloyal and uh, shape the, the legislative agenda, what works its way through the legislative process. How about their ability to raise money? So that is one of those things that speakers are expected to do. It's not a formal job. You don't find it in the rules of the House of Representatives. But um, they are expected to do it. And so it's one of the things that speakers simply have to do. They need to go out and and raise money. They need to do fundraisers. Uh, They go to members' districts when they're running for election or re-election. 
they're doing a lot of that campaign work to help other members of their party. So in recent years, there have been some organizational changes to the Congress in various, uh, under various speakers. One of those is the end of earmarks. Uh, first of all, explain what earmarks are, and did that change the power of the Speaker's office in any way? So uh, what earmarks are is uh, basically putting uh, special targeted funding into a larger spending bill. So you might have a bill for transportation, for example, that allocates X billions of dollars for roads. In that bill, it might say, uh, or in some other related language, X amount of money will go for this road or for that bridge. Um, and those are targeted to districts. Um, this was something that was a traditional in Congress, that members would do this, but they grew in size and expense uh, in the, I believe, early 2000s, late like 1990s, early 2000s. And so uh, when Republicans took over the House, uh, they banned earmarks. Um, one of the criticisms that's been made of, of the ban of earmarks is it takes away a tool available to leaders, including the Speaker, who uh, wish to build a majority for uh, legislation. They can't say anymore, if you vote for this bill, will put in some money for something in your district. Um, there's indirect ways of doing that, and informal ways, but it's no longer allowed under the rules to put those explicit earmarks into bills. Another thing that has changed in, in somewhat recent college, uh, Congresses is uh, the uh, seniority of, of uh, the committee chairs. The, long, the tenure is the word I'm looking for, sorry. Tenure of committee chairs. In past Congresses, committee chairs were every bit as powerful. Now they have a tenure under which they can serve. Has that given more power to the Speaker? That is one of the reasons that Speakers are more powerful, yes. And that started under uh, Speaker Newt Gingrich, who imposed term limits on committee chairs. It was actually something that the party had done before he became Speaker, and they maintained that rule. And with those term limits, what it means is you don't have folks who are chair for 10, 20, 30 years, um, sort of treating their committee as a sort of personal fiefdom. They have to constantly be moved out. And that uh, weakens their uh, institutional authority. And that has come, I would argue, largely um, at, in a, in a, uh, that the, the power of their power is declined as the power of the speaker has increased. So yes, it's one of the reasons that speakers are more powerful than they used to be. And the Senate side of Congress, the majority and minority leaders are powerful ones in the conferences, and we see them all the time uh, on, in their public roles, uh, shepherding legislation on the floor. In the House, there is both the speaker and the majority leader. So how does that relationship work between the two? So um, the the easiest way to think about this is that both the House and Senate have a top constitutional officer. In the House, it's the Speaker of the House, and in the Senate, it's the Vice President. But the key difference is that Vice Presidents are elected by the Electoral College or by the public at large, and Speakers are not. And so uh, the Senate did not always have a Vice President who is of the same party. And so from the majority party's view, giving power to the Vice President to the same degree that the majority party in the House might give power to the Speaker, could cause a lot of problems if the Vice President was of the other party. So instead what happened is in the Senate, each party established their top party leader, whom they elect, as effectively the most powerful person in the Senate. And for the majority party, it's the majority, majority leader. But in the House, the Speaker, um, because the Speaker is chosen by the whole House, but effectively by the majority party, the majority felt more comfortable giving the Speaker more authority. And so the majority leader, there is a majority leader, but really the top leader of the majority party in the House is the Speaker of the House. So before we delve into history, I want the, our audience to know who they're listening to. Uh, you're teaching now at Catholic University. What kind of courses do you teach? So I teach courses, a variety of courses on American politics. I teach Introduction to American Politics. I also teach a number of courses on political institutions. So I teach uh, classes on the U.S. Congress. Um, I teach a class now called Power in American Politics, where we talk about how power is exercised in uh, the legislative branch and the executive branch and by interest groups. Uh, and I recently finished a class called uh, Politics in the Age of Trump, where we talk about Trump's election, uh, why that happened, and the politics that um, kind of surround the Trump presidency. How did you get into teaching and join the academy? <laughs> uh, well, my father was a professor, actually. He was a history professor. Uh, and then I ended up, um, after college, going to Capitol Hill and working as a legislative aide for a number of years. And so I ended up combining my fascination, my, fas my, my interest in academia with my fascination and love for the le for legislative politics into the job I have now. What period of time were you on the Hill? I was there from uh, 1993 until 1998. And how close were you to being able to observe leadership? 
And did that whet your interest in studying leadership? Uh, it definitely whetted my interest. I don't know how close I got. I wasn't working for a leader, for example, but I was there for the 1994 election, which was a, a phenomenal experience because the Democrats had lost control of the House for the first time in 40 years. So you really got a sense of how consequential elections can be when you see a switch in power, um, which I saw. I mean, I, I tell a story of walking down the I think the Longworth uh, office building hallway the next day, and you could tell who was a Democrat and who was a Republican by the looks on their faces. Right? The Democrats looked like you know death had passed over them, and the Republicans were jubilant. It was a it was a really phenomenal experience. And then being there for Gingrich's early months as Speaker was another very um, you know really made a big impression on me about the power of the Speaker. Well, he's on our list, so we're going to talk more about him later on in our conversation. Uh, but if people search for you, they'll find also that you are a participant in a blog called Mischiefs of Faction, which is all college professors, political scientists. What does uh, what do you do in that blog? So the blog is um, it's about political parties. That's kind of what unifies uh, the the group of contributors. But um, what we write about are um, everything from uh, the majority party in Congress and leadership in Congress to um, the um, the Democratic primaries. Um, write about the the power of the president, uh, and then there's also. Um, uh, contributions about parties in other countries, uh, like in South America, um, how do parties work in different countries. So uh, we all come from the subject in a different perspective, but the idea is what we're writing about is political parties uh, writ large in contemporary politics. Where's the name come from? It's just a faction. Uh, it comes from the, um, it comes from, uh, I believe it comes from uh, the Federalist Papers, I believe. It was Alexander Hamilton. Well, well, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't, <laughs> you didn't I'm, the name. I'm pretty sure well, that's it. <laughs> it's not a mischief. Mischief of faction mm -hmm. is the title. We'll send people in that direction, and they can find more about its origin. So uh, there have been 54 people per, who have served as Speaker of the House over over time. How many of them are history making? Do you think percentage wise? Percentage wise, I would say, depending on how you count it, um, I would say maybe t uh, f 10 to 15 percent. And what makes for successful or powerful speakers? Well, from my perspective, I think several things make for a powerful speaker or an important speaker. Um, one is, and, and it could be any of a combination of these things, one is exercising significant influence on major legislation, helping get major bills passed in your chamber. Another is bringing about a significant institutional change in the House of Representatives, structuring the way, changing the way the House works or its structure. Um, uh, another is um, finding uh, new ways to use the powers that you already have to get things through, maybe, re maybe in terms of how you appoint folks to committees, for example. Um, those are some of the ways that I think speakers have distinguished themselves from uh, from others are important speakers always significant parliamentary tacticians not necessarily no some are very good at uh, parliamentary politics and know the rules and procedures others defer to their staff or to the parliamentarian on that and instead are more effective at um, influencing politics through their relationships with other members for example well to get started uh, this is only piquing my interest I thought it would be interesting to start with speakers that the house itself considered were so important that they named their major office buildings after them Cannon uh, Longworth and Rayburn mm -hmm. and we're going to start with Joe Cannon he served in office from 1903 to 1911 Republican from Illinois and he had a nickname Uncle Joe so tell tell me about him so Uncle Joe Cannon was was a character. Uh, he had this uh, white beard, had this stovepipe hat. Uh, always had a you know a cigar in his mouth, um, and he, so he was he was quite a distinguished character on uh, on the hill. But what really made him stand out was his use of power. He was, I would say, he represented the the sort of the apex of power in the speakership in the House of Representatives. He was the chair of the Rules Committee, which is the committee that decides what can come to the House floor and what uh, terms it can come to the floor. And there were only three members on the committee, so he effectively could decide what bills came to the floor and what didn't. It could be entirely up to him. Um, he was also not afraid to use his power to. Um, 
his power in the Rules Committee to block legislation, even if a lot of members wanted it. And he was also not afraid to punish members of his party who he felt were insufficiently loyal. So, for example, he famously punished some insurgents in his party who were causing him trouble, um, kicking them off committees, moving them to bad committees. He famously moved one member to the Committee on Ventilation and Acoustics, which is probably the worst committee you could be on in the House of Representatives. It does not exist today. It does not exist today, no. Um, and so uh, there's, a, there's this story, uh, it's probably apocryphal, but the story about a, a member of Congress at the time who got a letter from a constituent saying, can you please send me the rules of the House of Representatives? And the congressman just sent back a picture of Joe Cannon. He there was the rules of the House. The, just uh, so people who don't follow closely, today the Rules Committee is not presided over by the Speaker of the House. Correct. The Speaker does not serve on the Rules Committee and is not chair of the Rules Committee. The description of how he wielded power sounds um, counterintuitive to someone called Uncle Joe. Do you know how he got the nickname? <laughs> I don't. It, it, see, I don't it seems someone rather affable rather than someone who is cutting people off at the knees to achieve legislative aims. Well, keep in mind, he wasn't disliked. He wasn't a dislikable person. What was really the problem for members was his use of power, and particularly this group of insurgents, his more progressive members of the Republican Party. Of course, the Democrats weren't happy either, but the, most members of his party were perfectly happy, I think, with Cannon and his use of power. The time in which he served was also <clears throat> the time of Theodore Roosevelt. So how did the two get along? Uh, do, you, do you know about how their relationship fared? Uh, there was certainly conflict between the two. Uh, Roosevelt was advocating for more progressive legislation than Joe Cannon wanted. And um, there were times when Roosevelt would uh, be writing letters to Joe Cannon saying, can you, can you please let this bill come to the floor? Um, there was no sense that the speaker should just do what the president said. There was an understanding that the speaker had the power and the president just needed to ask. And Cannon often said no. He said, I don't agree with this progressive legislation. It's not coming to the floor. I don't care what you have to say. It's not going to happen. So they often did not see eye to eye on policy. And it was very frustrating, certainly for Roosevelt and definitely for the, um, the progressive insurgents in the Republican conference. So what legislative achievements did he accomplish? Well, I th would put him more in the category of what things did he prevent from passing. So there was a lot of progressive legislation that simply didn't get to the floor uh, and didn't move its way through. I mean, some things did, uh, <clears throat> but it was often uh, either from uh, because of Canada's great reluctance or some other means that progressives managed to get things to the floor. I think what Cannon is probably most famous for is inadvertently um, being the last speaker to have that much power because of this of rebellion that took place against his authority in 1910. Um, it was also the age of muckraking newspapers. So uh, how did they treat him and vice versa? Well, certainly Cannon got a lot of criticism from a lot of the press, and Democrats in particular had a field day with that and would say, you know, he's a czar, he is a dictator, you know, put us in charge, give us the majority, and we will not govern the way that, that Joe Cannon does. Um, you know, some of that muckraking journalism was useful for the progressives because they would bring up things like, um, you know, unsanitary, unsanitary food uh, conditions or, you know, canning facilities. And this would create pressure on Congress to enact, you know, progressive legislation regulating food supply, for example. But um, I don't think Cannon particularly cared if the press was critical of him. He saw his role as being the leader of his party in the House. It all came to a head, as you suggested, with a, a revolt inside the House, March 17th, 1910. That's St. Patrick's Day. Is that at all significant to the story? <laughs> I don't really think of it in terms of St. Patrick's Day. Um, I think of it uh, more in terms of how procedure happened to be used that, that particular day. Um, these, this was, again, this was a group of insurgents who were plotting with Democrats to try to weaken the, the Speaker's power. Were they generally the progressives? Mm -hmm. So it would be progressives in the Republican Party working with Democrats. And what they wanted to do was change the rules so that Cannon could not control the House floor through the Rules Committee. Um, and to make a long story short, they managed to bring to the floor a privileged motion that would um, take the Speaker off the Rules Committee and expand the Rules Committee from just three members to, I think, 15. And Cannon fought it, uh, just, he fought it uh, vehemently from the chair. Uh, he, he spent hours trying to get some absent Republicans to show up to defeat this motion, um, and he ultimately failed. And a coalition of Democrats and Republicans uh, were able to pass this and effectively strip the Speaker of one of his most important tools of power. 
Did he stay in the Congress after he lost that power? He did, actually, interestingly enough. There was an election in 1910. Republicans lost the House. Um, but if memory serves, he did, in fact, stay in the House. So you had former uh, you know, Uncle Joe Cannon, the most powerful speaker ever, now just a regular member of Congress like everybody else. Next on our list is the Longworth Building, uh, named after Nicholas Longworth, also a Republican, served from 1925 to 1931. Where's his home state? Uh, Ohio. And uh, what should we know about him? So Longworth was a, um, an interesting character. I think of him uh, as a kind of quintessential 1920s uh, leader. He was, you know, dapper. He, um, they had, he and his wife, Alice uh, Longworth, formerly Alice Roosevelt, daughter of uh, former president, um, would have these you know, social events. Um, there was certainly a lot of uh, drinking going on, despite prohibition. Um, he, he, he just strikes me, if, if you just see a picture of him, he just looks like a kind of quintessential 1920s character. He was a speaker who, um, like Joe Cannon, believed in strong party government. But the problem is, he came uh, later than Cannon, and so the speakership didn't have the formal tools that Cannon did. And Longworth especially hated what he called block government, which is when a group of the majority party works with the minority party to do what it wants against what the majority wants. So he had to find ways to be powerful without the tools that Joe Cannon had. So let's go back to Alice Roosevelt again, okay. daughter of the president. So did that <clears throat> enhance his relationship with the White House, or... Uh, how did that uh, how did that play in the larger Washington scene? Well, so Roosevelt wasn't president when he was speaker, right? So this yeah, was, but he tried to come back, right? right in 1912. Uh, <laughs> that's true. Um, I, I don't really know if it helped him or hurt him. I mean, Alice Longworth herself is quite a character, and we could spend a lot of time and talking about her. She would represent her. the progressives, right? Uh, Theodore Roosevelt was more of a progressive. I assume she's aligned with her father. Uh, I don't really know about her politics. I don't really think of her in that respect. I think of her as more someone who had very strong views about um, uh, personal behavior and was not afraid to express herself. She's a very strong, independent-minded woman. That certainly came from Teddy Roosevelt, who was himself an independent-minded president and I think raised his children to be similarly uh, inclined. The aforementioned John Nance Gardner was around during some time in this Congress. Um, I read about something that the two of them created called the Board of Education, uh, <laughs> where they brought members together. How did that function? So um, this was an interesting example of how you can be both uh, a partisan leader, but also um, uh, par say bipartisan or more emphasis on cooperation. So even though Longworth believed very strongly in the Republican Party and that it should govern, he was not afraid to open his door to Democrats and to work with the Democratic leadership, including John Nance Garner. So they would get together in this Board of Education and they could, uh, it was kind of a social scene. It was a way for them to socialize, to interact with each other, to communicate so that there weren't misunderstandings about what each party was going to do. Um, it's this kind of idea that in order for politics to work, you need to communicate, even with those you disagree with. I believe that alcohol was also served at the Board of Education meetings, which might have helped lubricate the discussions uh, between the folks who were there. But um, this was a tradition that actually continued, I don't think the drinking did, continue with uh, Sam Rayburn, we can talk about later. Um, this idea that you sit down with members, and it can be members of the other party as well, to just talk to just communicate about what's going on and what you expect is going to happen uh, in the agenda. Does anything like that exist informally in today's Congress? Not to my knowledge. Is that a loss for the institution? I think it's a loss for the institution, yes. I think there's nothing wrong with leaders communicating with each other. Now, there could be communications happening behind the scenes, and of course, with modern technology, for all I know, you know, Nancy Pelosi and Kevin McCarthy, the minority leader, are texting each other. I have no idea, but this idea of a social place where you could go without the scrutiny of the media or others, um, I, I don't think that we see that in Congress today. Given his tenure to, to 1931, that would have put him in the speaker's chair during the crash of the stock market. Uh, so what happened um, in the Congress, and how did the, how did the House respond to the, the devastation that was happening in the economy? Um, well, it was, a, it was an unusual period there, a kind of period of transition. Um, Partly because uh, the um, at one point, I think it was the 1930 election, it was actually unclear which party was going to be in the majority. I think there was some 
uh, members who had passed away, um, along with himself, died unexpectedly. Um, and so that created a kind of leadership vacuum. Um, and in terms of dealing with the recession, because you did not have a kind of, you didn't have FDR until 1933, and so both parties were um, kind of trying to deal with this, this economic downturn using kind of older techniques and an um, older agenda, if you will. So this idea that the government should spend a lot of money and go into debt to improve the economy was not something that many members agreed with. So you actually had Democrats saying things like, we should actually cut spending because that's how you get out of a deficit. You reduce spending, uh, and then the, the, you have a budget surplus, and then things improve. So it, neither party, I think, necessarily had the tools at their disposal to figure out how to deal with the Great Recession. The third building that the House of Representatives honored, uh, naming after a former speaker, is the Rayburn Building, named after Sam Rayburn. Tell me about him. Sam Rayburn was the longest serving speaker in House history. He was first made speaker in 1940 and served until 1961 with a couple of breaks when the Republicans took over the House, two two year breaks. Um, from Texas, former speaker of the State House. And um, in many ways, he personified and helped um, um, kind of implement a, a way of governing that was um, a really characterized the House of Representatives from the 1930s, I would say, through the 1970s. And it was a system in which you deferred to committees, uh, a system in which committee chairs were very powerful. It was a system in which seniority was the most important thing because you became a chair if you were the most senior on your committee. Um, and it was a system in which you had a careful balance between two wings of your party. In his case, it was the liberal, northern liberals and southern conservatives. And it was, in many ways, a kind of small C conservative house. You didn't necessarily see the house doing a lot of major legislation. Um, they would generally take the lead of the president, particularly on foreign affairs. Um, and because Rayburn was there for so long and, and um, helped kind of enforce this system, it really made the house, really put his imprint on the house for many decades. What was the key to his longevity? Why did his members continue to elect him? Uh, I think there were a number of things. Um, one of them was that he was a master at bargaining. Um, there, there's, a, there's a whole theory of speakers called the middleman theory, where speakers have to be in the middle, kind of the median member of their party and work with both sides. And he was very good at balancing those two wings. He, uh, so he had, the, he had almost the automatic support of Southerners because he was from Texas. Um, but he also had his door open to, to liberals. They were a smaller group in the party. Um, but he did not shut them out uh, or try to defeat them or anything of that sort. I think the other thing is that he recognized that it was a, an ideological balance and a regional one. So he had set up what's called the Austin-Boston connection, where you have this, you always have two people in leadership, one from the south, Texas area, and one from the north, Boston area. So uh, Rayburn was from Texas. His majority leader, John McCormick, was from Boston. And then when uh, McCormick became speaker, uh, the majority leader was uh, Carl Albert from Oklahoma, neighboring Texas. So by keeping the, the, the regional balance and leadership, you have both sides more or less satisfied, and that allows you to maintain power. He had a very famous protege, Lyndon Johnson. Do you know how that relationship started, Bonnie Chang? How that relationship started? Lyndon Johnson was elected to the House uh, when Rayburn was speaker, if I recall. Uh, and two, two Texans, yeah. Yes, two Texans. Um, and Lyndon Johnson was a master of figuring out who had power and how to get into their good graces. So he, um, you know, through his charm and through whatever else, you know, tools he had at his disposal, he managed to win over Rayburn. Um, if memory serves, I think he was the only person who would rub Rayburn's head. He was bald. I think that was the kind of Johnson form of affection. I don't know what other people thought of that. Um, but by kind of um, connect, drawing that, you know, bringing himself closer to Rayburn, I think that helped. The other thing that Johnson did is he served the party. Uh, he uh, did a lot to help members get reelected by raising money uh, from, you know, wealthy oil interests in his district in the state of Texas. And doing that kind of service to the party is something that can win, win over other members, including leadership. I ask about that relationship because we have a clip we want to show about Sam Rayburn, and it comes from Lyndon Johnson's biographer, Robert mm. Caro. This was uh, taped in April of 2012. Let's listen to him talk about Sam Rayburn. Power doesn't always corrupt. 
power can cleanse. It cleanses, for example, in the case of Sam Rayburn, who had to keep quiet as a representative until he became uh, first a powerful committee chairman, and then this, but then you see him moving the Senate, to, uh, the House of Representatives, to uh, populist legislation. So as he gained power, he became more visible, more vocal. Uh, he also said about him that nobody could buy Sam Rayburn. Can you use those two observations and use that to tell us more about Sam Rayburn and how he approached the House? So in terms of <clears throat> no one could buy Sam Rayburn, I think uh, one of his most noteworthy um, characteristics was that uh, he was seen as um, uh, a very um, upstanding and moral individual. There was no sense that he had, uh, that he was trying to benefit any particular special interests other than the interests of his own district. Um, there was no sense that he, um, you know, that he had, there was no belief that he lacked any sort of principle. It wasn't that, well, he can just be you know, persuaded to take one position or another. Um, and I think also, you know, as Robert Carroll points out, um, even though Rayburn may have been more upfront when he became speaker, he still was fairly quiet, and that, that's an important tool to have as a leader, is you keep your cards close to your vest. So there are instances in which he actually helped uh, liberals, for example, in civil rights, but he did it very quietly behind the scenes so that um, it, wasn't, it wouldn't alienate uh, a wing of his party. Um, it also, by the way, makes it hard to study Rayburn. I've, I've visited the Rayburn papers uh, in, in uh, Austin, and he didn't write very much down. It's, he didn't put a lot to paper. Uh, so it's hard to know sometimes, many times, what he was thinking. And I think that that undoubtedly extended to the way he governed as speaker. Well, following up on that, you said earlier that one tool that a speaker has or one responsibility is being the public face of the institution. Would the public at the time have seen very much of Sam Rayburn? They would not, no. There was no televised uh, floor proceedings. Um, Rayburn was famously resistant to any kind of electronics in the chamber in terms of voting machines, cameras, radios, none of that. He did not want it there. And so I think a lot of people certainly might know what he looked like from a picture in the, in the newspaper, but it wouldn't be the same as say, seeing the speaker at a press conference. In my research, I found two major legislative things I wanted to ask you about to see if you know more. First, that first major crisis was World War II after he came into office, and he shepherded through a victory on the draft. Do you know any more about that story? Yes, it's a, it's a really good story because it shows how, even though Rayburn didn't have the formal tools that, say, a Joe Cannon had, he, um, he had informal ways of influencing the legislative process. So to make a long story short, there's a temporary draft, and it's going to expire, and uh, President Roosevelt wants it extended another six months because there's still a war going on, and it's possible the U.S. might get involved. A lot of people don't want this. They either are being drafted or they have sons who have been conscripted, and they don't want this to continue, so it's an unpopular bill. But Rayburn agrees with, um, that with Roosevelt this needs to happen. So what he does is he, um, he talks to the president, and they craft a bill that they think can get a majority. He starts lobbying members of Congress. He lobbies a lot of them. Uh, at one point, he doesn't have enough votes, so he delays floor proceedings for a day so he can get more votes. It comes to the floor. He still doesn't have the votes. He's lobbying on the floor while it's being debated. Um, then the vote count starts, and he presides over the House chamber. And at one point, um, it's, it's just narrowly passing. It's passing by three votes. And a member gets up and changes his vote. Now it's only passing by one vote, and there's other members of Congress who are getting up asking to be recognized, and Rayburn just slams the gavel down, says the vote's done, it passed. And it's a great example of how critical he was in getting major legislation passed. Without Rayburn, we might not have extended the draft. The third time that he came back as Speaker, by this time Lyndon Johnson has moved to the Senate, and he is majority leader, uh, we, but we have a Republican president, Eisenhower. So how did that axis work between the three? So um, I think that the best way to describe that is um, you had a combination of um, kind of a inherent deference that Rayburn would give presidents um, of either party because he believed it was important to support the presidency and to give the institutional presidency, you know, the president a chance to succeed, uh, coupled with the political um, skills of Rayburn and Lyndon Johnson. Uh, Johnson... Uh, believed in, in winning, and he believed in understanding what you can achieve. And so 
going up against a president or an opponent just for the sake of it wouldn't be smart politics. But if it can get you something, then that would be smart politics. And I think many times uh, Eisenhower, um, Johnson, and Rayburn did not disagree all that much on major legislation. I mean, Eisenhower was not that conservative a president, and Rayburn certainly was not that liberal a speaker. So um, the idea that you can't get things done because of divided government wouldn't have made a lot of sense during that time period. I, one other World War II story I wanted to get in here because it's mm -hmm. so interesting. Only seven members of Congress at the time that he was Speaker, including the Majority Leader, were aware of, of the Manhattan Project, which mm -hmm. developed the atomic bomb. <clears throat> Uh, but yet he had to find funding for it. How did he do that? Um, that is not a story that I'm that I that I'm that familiar with. I do know that um, again because Rayburn was uh, really believed in working with the White House uh, and doing things behind the scenes. That um, you know, if memory serves, he uh, basically worked with the Appropriations Committee and Appropriations Chair and said, "This is what we need, uh, and let's get it." Um, and with the understanding that national security was at stake, it wasn't that hard to do. You also had less scrutiny about what Congress was doing back then. So you could find ways to get money in spending bills without having people blog about it. Interesting point versus today. I'm, I'm going to very quickly dip into history only because this, this piece of videotape is so interesting. And I want to talk about Henry Clay, but only briefly because we're going to run out of time. Sure. But we found on the Internet a, a, a Transylvania College seminar there in Kentucky in two, 2011, and they invited three people who have been Speaker of the House uh, to talk about Henry Clay. I just want to play that for you and just get your reaction to it. Let's watch. Took you 12 years to become Speaker of the House. Took you 20 years. Took you 20 years. When you hear about Henry Clay becoming Speaker on the very first day, <laughs> does it make you feel like kind of a loser? A slow learner. <laughs> and if you look at uh, the period from 1820 uh, to 1860, there was no one person in the United States more responsible for holding our union together than Henry Clay. Right outside of what used to be the Speaker's office, it was the Speaker's office for Tip O'Neill, it was the Speaker's office for uh, Jim Wright, and, and, it was, and it is, now the Speaker's office has moved to another location, but exactly right outside the door of the Speaker's office, in Statuary Hall, Henry Clay. He's looking very distinguished, very dapper, looking into the distance. And you try to imagine, says statesman leader, what is he, where is he looking? You know, the time that uh, Henry Clay was served in, in, in the uh, U.S. Congress, both as, in the Senate and as Speaker, was an amazing time in the United States. I mean, the, the Kentucky, we were, this is the frontier. And uh, going back to the Missouri Compromise, the um, Treaty of Ghent that he signed, uh, which takes us back to the War of 1812, he really did have some amazing influences. So, uh, lots to talk about with just that one clip, but, I, but uh, uh, he served in, Henry Clay served in a number of important roles, including famously uh, Secretary of State uh, in the so-called corrupt bargain. Uh, he was also in the Senate. So, why does he belong on our impactful speakers list? So, there's a political scientist named Ron Peters who put it best. He said that Clay was our first strong speaker. And the reason why, which was a, another political scientist, Randy Strahan, said he drew on all of the possible sources of power. Uh, he was the first speaker to do that and use them effectively. Um, he, was, um, he was a very assertive parliamentarian. He was willing to enforce the rules. He was very um, strategic in committee assignments and, and uh, to get legislation through, particularly tariff legislation. Um, he oversaw a, mat a dramatic expansion of the, of the committee system in the House of Representatives. Um, he was a, f a forceful individual. He, I believe he had been Speaker in the State House before. Um, so in some ways, the fact that he was the first freshman to be chosen, and only freshman to be chosen Speaker, other than Frederick Muhlenberg in the, in the first Congress, really speaks to all of the assets that he already had coming into the office. And then he just used them uh, very effectively. Would you say a quick word on the two former speakers, uh, both Republicans, John Boehner and Dennis Hastert, and where they might be in history? We haven't had that long lens of history to look back. but Right, yes. So um, both of the, um, it's interesting, Hastert probably um, 
uh, and I've written about Hastert, I think um, m- most people, the conventional wisdom is that he wasn't that important a speaker because his majority leader, uh, Tom DeLay, had much more influence. And Tom DeLay, to be sure, was very powerful majority leader and before that whip. Um, but that understates the, the important role that Hastert played on a number of occasions in winning over votes. You know, he thought of himself as the coach, right? His job is to kind of bring the party together and keep it together. And you have to do that and not just, you know, use whipping or use threats or promises. You also have to have a sense of unity. Uh, and he was very good at kind of bringing members in and persuading them to do things. Um, but f- the first line of his biography will also be the personal problems that sent him to prison afterwards, correct? Well, right. Now, that, that came out after he was uh, speaker. Um, and that's one of the things that when you are trying to analyze the contribution of a speaker, you have to think about what is it they did before they were speaker, when they were speaker, and after, and determine how you're going to evaluate them. And so thinking about, as a political scientist, his leadership in the House is one thing. And then thinking about the, the, the personal issues and the, the ethics and criminal problems that he had uh, is another set of issues to consider when evaluating him. Um, John Boehner, one sentence or two, because I'm going to run out of time if we spend much time on him. Do you have, what do you have to say about his tenure? Sure. I, I've written that Boehner was a, a, a Rayburn speaker in a Gingrich house. He, um, he, liked to, he wanted to compromise. He wanted to negotiate. He wanted to make deals. But his party and the larger political context just made that too difficult for him. And so he had to deal with factions like the House Freedom Caucus um, that really caused him trouble. And ultimately, he resigned from the House. We're going to talk about another speaker who had a nickname, which was Czar Reed, Thomas Reed of Maine, uh, three Congresses between 1889 and 1899. And what should we know about him? So he was, I would say, the most influential speaker in terms of the way the House operates. Um, When he was rising up in leadership in the uh, 1870s, 1880s, the House was becoming paralyzed by uh, filibustering and by dilatory tactics. And the reason why is because, among other things, the rules of the House made it very easy for individual members to slow things down. So, for example, you had what was called the disappearing quorum. The House requires a quorum to do business, which is usually a majority, um, but you could choose not to participate in a vote even if you were on the floor. And if less than a quorum participated in a vote, there was no quorum, and then everything would have to stop until you could get the quorum back. And so the idea was it's very easy to slow things down that way. So when Reed became speaker, one of the uh, early things that he did uh, was a, this, this, uh, con- this um, contested elections bill was coming to the House floor. And Democrats were in the minority, and they chose not to participate in a vote. And there were enough Republicans that were absent that uh, there was no quorum. So Reed just started counting the members who were in the chamber but hadn't decided to participate. Uh, and they were infuriated. The Democrats said, this is an outrage. I don't want to be counted. And so, you know, Reed had, you know, these, these funny lines and someone said, I don't want to be counted. And, and the speaker says, you know, Reed says something to the effect of the gentleman uh, says that, you know, the, the gentleman protests the, the, the speaker counting him here. Does he deny that he's here? And, of course, everyone laughed because you can't deny you're there without being there. Uh, and that, once that died down, he ultimately brought about a change in the rules that are known as Reed rules, uh, which prevented dilatory actions, stopped the disappearing quorum, and made other changes that effectively made the House a majoritarian chamber. So the majority party gets to run the show, which is what we have today. He resigned from Congress over a point of principle. Correct. So he was a big believer in party loyalty, but he also was a big believer in the party agenda. And what was happening uh, with uh, President McKinley was um, the country was moving towards war, uh, to um, this, what would become the Spanish-American War. And Reed felt very strongly that that was not, uh, that was not appropriate. This was a war of, um, this was a war of imperialism or a war of, of you know, expanding of territory, which was not the proper role of the government, as he saw, saw it. And he actually tried to use his power of speakers to prevent uh, issues related to going to war to come to the floor, but he simply could not. And he eventually felt that he just it wasn't tenable for him to remain a speaker, and so he resigned. Our next uh, speaker, significant speaker, brought television to the House of Representatives. Thomas P. Tip O'Neill, Democrat, served from 1977 to 87, the longest uninterrupted tenure. We had people that were longer that you talked about, but they came and went. Longest uninterrupted tenure, nine years, 350 days, elected five times. Uh, what was his leadership style like? So O'Neill was, I would say, the first um, 
partisan speaker since um, Longworth, for sh- and definitely since uh, Cannon. What had happened in the 1970s is the Democratic Party in the House was becoming more liberal, and the Southern Wing was was shrinking. And with that, there were changes that were being made to the rules of the party that weakened committees and gave more power to the Speaker and to the party as a whole. Um, but the Speaker at the time, John McCormick, was not interested really in governing in a partisan way. It really, uh, and then his successor, Carl Albert, somewhat more so, but still not, you know, comfortable being highly partisan. O'Neill was the first to sort of embrace these tools and to encourage more rules changes to give the majority party and the speaker more power. And so during this time, what you saw was an increased number of restrictive rules. So a bill would come to the floor and the rule that went with it would maybe limit the number of amendments that were allowed or limit the debate time that was permitted. And that was usually more harmful to the minority party, to Republicans. And so um, gradually you see more power being centralized with the speakership and with the majority party at the expense of the minority party. Now, having said that, Tip O'Neill was also, uh, you know, he's also a very likable person. Uh, He was a very social person. He was known for just sitting on the House floor uh, while things were going on to just kind of get a sense of what was happening. And any member who had any issues or problems could come to him. So that was one of the reasons, too, that he had some degree of popularity with members of both parties. Both he and his Republican counterpart, uh, Bob Michael, uh, led caucuses in the House that were the post-Watergate era, excuse me, post-Vietnam era of uh, politicians and uh, younger, more more technology oriented. Were their leadership styles akin to the people that they were trying to um, oversee? Um, yes and no. Uh, yes, in that they were more so than their predecessors had been, like, say, in the Republican side, uh, John Rhodes, um, uh, and in the Democratic side, um, folks like Carl Albert, although Albert did start using, um, I think, radio and a little television for the first time. But um, I think they were generally more comfortable with it than their predecessors had been. But they also found themselves challenged by some of those members. So on the Democratic side, folks like Dick Ephart, and the Republican side, folks like Newt Gingrich, these young up-and-coming members who really focused on the use of television uh, and media to cultivate not only um, their districts, but also state or even national reputations. And that was a new phenomenon that I would say Michael and O'Neill kind of had to learn to adjust to. Well, we have a piece of video that's classic for C-SPAN's history, uh, and it is from 1984. Rest of Republicans who were tired of that 40 years in the minority began to use television as a tool to make their case. Uh, This became dubbed by the news media at the time, Cam Scam. Let's watch the interaction with the speaker on the House floor. Very interesting. My personal opinion is this. You deliberately stood on that well before an emptied house and challenged these people, and you challenged their Americanism. And it's the lowest thing that I've ever seen in my 32 years in Congress. Mr. Speaker, if I may reclaim my time. Let me say, first of all, Mr. That, Speaker, I move that we take the Speaker's words down. So uh, <laughs> people won't understand what it means to take the Speaker's <clears throat> words down. How significant was that? Uh, at the time, it was highly significant. Um, the rules of the House require that uh, all members uh, follow decorum. In, ter- in what they're saying. You can't insult people. You can't accuse people of things. Um, you can't question their motives. And um, for the Speaker of the House of Representatives, who's supposed to be in charge of the decorum of the House, to break that rule uh, was, was significant. His words were taken down, although the punishment, was, which would have been to not be able to be on the floor for the rest of the day, um, they ended, the Republicans graciously said, we won't impose that punishment. But it was unprecedented, really, for a speaker to have their words taken down. Um, what that showed is a couple of things. So I said that O'Neill was a likable person. He also had a temper. And what uh, the Republicans, particularly Newt Gingrich, found was a way to get O'Neill upset. Um, not knowing what might happen, but as it turned out, by getting him upset, he ended up kind of losing his cool uh, and saying things on the floor that um, ended up getting him in trouble. The group that uh, that Newt Gingrich was aligned with, the Conservative Opportunity Society, ultimately did take power in the House in 1995. 
uh, you were there for in that time, Newt Gingrich becomes Speaker of the House, displacing Bob Michael, who had been the long-term leader of the Republicans in, in the Congress. So what kind of Speaker was Newt Gingrich after being the revolutionary that aspired to power in the Congress? Well, his first year, and certainly his first few months, he was um, undoubtedly the most powerful speaker that the House had seen in decades. Um, he was, um, he um, sort of decided, he, he was willing to, to, um, uh, to, over, to ignore seniority in choosing some committee chairs. We said, this person is next in line, but they don't have my vision for, that, for the party and what we should do. Um, so we'll go down the, the the rank and f the you know the seniority list and find somebody who will be. Um, he, he and the Republicans had had drafted this contract with America, this campaign uh, document about the things they would do if they were elected, and that became the agenda of the House Republican Party and the House of Representatives. And that agenda and those items were being moved through with the um, you know through leadership. So uh, certainly, um, so Dick Armey, the majority leader. Uh, Tom DeLay, but also Newt Gingrich. They would determine what was in the legislation that was coming from the contract. They determine the procedures under which it would come to the floor. Um, they would work. They did communications and framing to figure out how to sell it. Um, a lot of these things went through task forces that had been appointed by Gingrich, so he could control all the members who would review this legislation. And it was a remarkable period in which the House was really the center of policy making. And Gingrich was at the center of that center. So ultimately, what brought him down? Um, well, a series of things ended up bringing down Newt Gingrich. Um, the, 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 I'd say the precipitating factor was the end of 1995, when there were a pair of government shutdowns that had to do with a showdown between Republicans, really in the House, and President Clinton. And the idea was, we need Clinton to sign our legislation. If he won't... Um, then the government will shut down because he didn't sign the legislation we want that has funding for the government. So Clinton basically called their bluff, and people were upset about the shutdowns. They were suffering, and um, they ended up blaming Gingrich and the Republicans for it. And from that point on, there was considerable doubt in the Republican conference that Gingrich was able to strategically outsmart President Clinton and help their party avoid electoral and political problems. Um, it was ultimately, though, not until there was a coup attempt in 1997 with some disgruntled Republicans, but it was ultimately after the 1998 elections when the Republicans in the House lost seats, which was the first time that a party that does not control the White House but does control the House lost seats since 1934. And many Republicans had finally had it, and they said, this, it's, you know, we have to blame somebody for this. Uh, and Gingrich really uh, should go, and so he left. How many of the major changes that he had, he brought to the institution, because he came in with a package of changes as well about how the place would run, how many of those became permanent and are still followed today? Uh, a number of them are still permanent. So some of the changes he made to the committee system, getting rid of some committees, uh, the Office of Technology Assessment, I believe he abolished. Um, he, um, he also had instituted this idea of term limits for committee chairs and also for the speaker. That one didn't last under Hastert. They, they got rid of it. But um, this idea of term limits has, has remained a potent one in the House. Um, he also had started experimenting with televising the speaker's press conference. Yes. That didn't last very long. It did not, because that is a difficult environment in which to control your message. And reporters would ask him things that, you know, sometimes Gingrich would say the wrong thing, and suddenly it's, it's on camera, uh, and you can't undo it. Um, I would say other changes, I, I would say, frankly, I mean, besides the idea that the speaker really should be at the center of policymaking, which in many ways we see today, I think one of the most important changes was uh, changing how the House operated. So one of the things they did is they did an audit of the House of Representatives and found there were a lot of financial irregularities, things that were not done professionally. Uh, and so they streamlined the process and made it more professional. Um, and that really, I think, was, in my opinion, one of the most important and long-lasting changes that Gingrich and fellow Republicans brought to Congress. Well, we have about five minutes, and I want to spend those on Nancy Pelosi. She's guaranteed a place in history as the first woman to lead the House of Representatives. Uh, she returned to power after losing it once third speaker to pride over, preside over a presidential impeachment in our history. Uh, when, you, when historians begin to assess her term, even as it's still unfolding, what are the kinds of things they'll be looking for? I think they'll look, be looking at a number of things. One of them is her 
uh, legislative leadership. So he, she has been very much involved in some major legislation that's been passed through uh, the House of Representatives. Exhibit A would be the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare. Uh, and her involvement in crafting the legislation, negotiating with different factions in her party, figuring out how to get the bill through the House, particularly when the Senate majority, Senate Democrats lost their, their filibuster-proof majority, n- n- negotiating that with them, with the White House. She was a major player in that. I think they'll also um, uh, note her incredible um, and dogged determination to help her party in campaign politics. I mean, her ability to raise money and to visit districts is just phenomenal. It's just, it's, I don't know where she gets the energy to do that, frankly, but she's been doing that consistently as speaker. And related to that is her ability to keep her party together. There have been differences, there have been divisions, but she manages to find a way to keep the different factions in the caucus together when it really matters. Um, and whether it's her ability to count votes or do favors for members, uh, I think those those kinds of things really set her apart from a lot of speakers of the House. Our last piece of video is very recent, February 6th, and this is the State of the Union night. Let's, let's watch. I tore up a manifesto of mistruths. It's very hard for us to get you to talk about the issues that we are working on. He misrepresented all of that. It was necessary to get the attention of the American people to say this is not true and this is how it affects you. They're vicious and mean. Vicious. These people are vicious. Nancy Pelosi is a horrible person. And she wanted to impeach a long time ago when she said, I pray for the president. I pray for the president. She doesn't pray. She may pray, but she prays for the opposite. <laughs> but I doubt she prays at all. Morning after the State of the Union, we're famous, famously the image of the speaker at the end of the speech tearing the, the uh, president's speech, the copy that she had apart. So I'm wondering, in history, the animosity between these two leaders. Have, has there ever been anything like this that well, you studied? <laughs> we've come a long way from the days of Sam Rayburn and, and Dwight Eisenhower, this idea that you work together, even if you're in separate elected uh, institutions. Uh, and this idea that the speaker in particular should be deferential to the president. We were, that's just not what, we, what we're seeing now. Um, there's a way in which that is a sign of a healthy, vigorous partisan differences, right? It's if you disagree with the president or you disagree with the speaker, you shouldn't be afraid to say so. But I think, um, and this is what troubles me, and I've written about this, there are certain ways in which um, our elected officials, we expect to kind of share some common uh, agreement on issues, or at least a sense that they share these, they have these important roles to play, these institutional roles that should rise above their policy differences. Um, and I think that what happened at the State of the Union address and how each of the players have reacted shows that um, things like the State of the Union address aren't serving the purpose that they used to. It's not a way for the public to see our elected officials coming together and saying that there are problems we need to solve, but more of an avenue for each of these players to kind of say, I'm right, the other side is wrong, either through what I say or through the gestures that I, that I use. Um, and that kind of thing I, I personally don't think is, is healthy for the republic. Matthew Green, the author of a number of books about congressional leadership. I read you're working a bi- on a biography of Newt Gingrich's tenure, is that correct? Yes, with Jeff Crouch, who's a professor at American University. And when will that be out? Um, soon, I hope. We're wrapping it up now. And also a teacher of students at Catholic University. Thank you for taking us on a walk through history. I think we can spend an hour on each one of these people. But thanks for giving us the top line on these powerful speakers and how they affected their, our country and also the institution. Well, it was my pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Q&A. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and you'll never miss an episode. While you're there, please take a minute to rate and review us. You can also send us an email at podcasts at c-span.org with questions, comments, or ideas. Your feedback is most welcome.